Hello and welcome to this short course on how to make silver jewellery. This is a beginner's level course and in this first video I'm going to show you the tools and materials you need to make silver jewellery from home. So silver jewellery is a really rewarding technique to be able to learn to do. You can make beautiful pieces for yourself or to sell, but it can be a little bit intimidating when you first start out and want to be able to do it from home. So I'm here to let you know that you can absolutely achieve this in a home studio setting or just in a corner of your house where you find some space. And I'm going to talk you through all the basic tools and materials you need. There's quite a lot that I have on the bench today, so I'm gonna talk through the essentials and then also some additional items that you might want to build up to over time. So to start off with, when we're making silver jewelry, we want to be able to cut our metal. So often we start with a sheet, a piece of sheet silver or some wire, and we need to be able to cut it. And in order to do that, we need a saw. So this is a jeweler's saw. Sometimes it's called a piercing saw and you can see that it has a very fine blade in there as well and these are used for cutting our pieces so you'll need to make sure that you have your piercing saw and your saw blades. The saw blades come in all different sizes um, so there's a two cut, three cut, four cut. Uh, I'd normally recommend starting with two cut and you might want some three and fours as well and there are other sizes too and the the number refers to how coarse or fine the saw blade is so we want to make sure that we have one of those next we want to make sure we have a bench peg of some sort so if you have a jeweler's bench like i've got at the moment they come with a peg on the front and the jeweler's bench is something you probably want to work up to it's a really nice piece of equipment to have but when we're first starting out it's not always affordable in terms of space and actually purchasing the piece of equipment. So the most important part of it to begin with is the peg. So this is my bench peg and I've actually got two here that I work with. So this one comes with the bench and what most jewelers will do is cut out a V shape in the middle of the bench. So you can just use a regular saw to cut out a V shape or I actually quite like having a flat one because I use it quite a lot for my sanding and my polishing. And then I have a separate bench peg at the side, which already has a pre-cut V in it. And it's also got some other little areas that I can use to support my work. So if I'm using a piece of silver, then I can place it over my peg and do my sawing, do my filing, do my polishing. And you'll see that in some of the videos that are coming up as well. When you first buy a bench peg, you will normally buy one that looks a little bit like this. So if you've got a starter kit or anything like that, you might have already seen these. And this is a clamp-on bench peg. So these are great because you can just attach them to any table. So it just kind of unscrews and you clamp it on there. And then the front bit here, you can cut your V shape out of, or you can leave it flat. It's entirely up to you, whichever is easiest for you to work with. So that's a really useful piece of kit. To be honest, you can start making without a bench peg, but as soon as you have one, you'll never want to go back because they are really useful and helpful for supporting your work. So some other pieces that are useful to have. Next up is a hand file. So here I've got a half round, or sometimes they're called D-shaped, hand file. This one, if you're only getting one hand file, I'd recommend getting this one. You can also get flat ones, they're very helpful, but of course there's a flat side on this, so you can always use that. And the curved side is great for filing rings and any curved kind of concave shapes. They come like this, this can be a little bit confusing because they come without the handle on, and you can buy the handle separately and attach it. To be honest, sometimes I don't even attach a handle and I just use them as they are, but some of my, some of my files do have handles on. And to attach the handle, which is a wooden, it's just a wooden handle, you just need to heat up this end with your torch, which I'll show you in a minute, and then push it firmly into the handle. I remember when I first got my hand files and I was a bit confused as to why the handle didn't come, so don't worry, you can either use them as they are or attach a handle. But really useful to have one of these. And this is a cut two. Uh, they again come in different sizes based on how coarse they are. Cut two is a very good starter one and it's quite universal. It's not too coarse, not too fine. So it'll be great for the projects we're gonna be working on. It's really handy to have a drill. So if you're gonna be making pendants or charms, earrings, anything that you wanna put a hole in, 
you want to have a drill. This is a kind of entry level drill. It's called a pin vise. And you can see that I've just got a drill bit in the top. So it comes apart and I can put all different thicknesses of drill into there. So normally you buy the pin vise with a set of drills so that you can attach different sizes based on how big you want your hole to be. Now, to be honest, this does take a while to drill through silver. I also use it for metal clay, which it's great for. But to drill through silver, after a while of making your pieces, you're going to want to invest in a little bit more of a, a drill that's a bit quicker. So you can either get an electric drill or a bow drill, or you might even look at getting a pendant motor style drill. But to begin with, this is a great starting point. Some other things that I've got here. So I've got my steel block. So when I'm forming my metal and I want to hammer it or I want to shape it in different ways, this is a really useful bit of kit for that. So I'd recommend everyone have a steel block. Again, it's not essential to begin with, but it's quite a, a useful tool to have. And something that's nice to go along with that are your hammers and mallets. So this is a rawhide mallet, again, a very useful bit of kit. And this is, mallet is a different to hammer because mallets will shape your metal without actually affecting the texture of it. So if I have a silver ring, for example, I wanna make it a little bit bigger, I would use a mallet to push it down a mandrel, which I'll show you next. Whereas if I use a metal hammer, like this one I've got here, which is useful as well, it will texture the piece. So it will actually change the surface texture. So they're the kind of two different ones that I'd recommend starting with. And you can build up your, your hammer collection as you go through as well. But one nice hammer to start with is a good idea and a mallet. Then this is a mandrel, a ring mandrel. So it's a tapered stick and it has all different sizes on. Uh, some of them come with sizes, some of them come without. Uh, it depends on what you're making. But if you're gonna be making lots of rings, I really recommend one of these. It's really an essential piece for making rings because we'll hammer our ring shape around it so that's a useful piece as well then we talked about files but you also probably want some needle files so you can get a little set of needle files and these are small fine files they come in different shapes and sizes really useful for just getting into little tiny bits of jewelry or little areas um, and I always have those on my bench too This is a nice piece of kit that I, I, I really like. It's uh, reverse action tweezers. So they come on their own and you can actually buy those on their own. And I definitely would recommend having those in your kit. Then this is an additional extra. You don't have to have this, but again, if you're making lots of rings and perhaps you wanna solder stone settings onto them or solder earring posts onto earrings, then this is really helpful. It's called a third hand. So the third hand just holds it. It is literally like having a third hand. <laughs> it holds the piece in place uh, while you're soldering, which is really handy too. So if you're, you're starting basic, I would just start with the, the tweezers and then I would build up to having the third hand as well. So next up, you're gonna to wanna to have a soldering station. So this is an area where you can solder your work. And there's a few things I'm gonna talk through that are involved in that. To start with, you're going to want a fire brick. So this is a fire brick. My one's been used a bit, so it's got some bits and pieces on, but they come just pretty plain. And it's normally an asbestos substitute, and they are just the area that is heat proof on your, on your workbench so that you can heat pieces and do your soldering and all those things very safely. You also might want to have a heat proof mat which hopefully you can see is just down here. It's just a, a wider piece than the brick. Not essential, you can just work from your soldering brick, but if you've got a heat proof map, it just makes the area that you can work on when you're working with hot metal larger. So it's something to build up towards. Next up, you're gonna need some flux. So I use something called a borax dish and a cone. And this is a very traditional method used in jewelry making. We add a little bit of water to it, mix it round, and that will make up the flux. If you're not entirely sure what flux is, don't worry for, for now. We're gonna cover that in the making bit of this course, but essentially we need to have this because the solder can't flow without it. And also a little paintbrush to be able to apply our flux to our metals. There are different types of flux. There's a liquid flux. There's also paste flux. 
Whatever you use is entirely up to you, but this is the one that I tend to use and is quite a universal one for all your pieces. Now, of course, your workbench wouldn't be complete without your torch. So you wanna make sure you have a hand torch. This is the one that I use. There are a variety of different ones on the market. If you're making larger pieces, you will need a larger torch. So if you're really interested in doing bangles or big pieces with lots of different areas that you need to connect together, you will need a larger torch. But to begin with, this is a great starter torch. And I'm gonna show you how to use that in a little bit as well. Your torch is filled with gas, so you need to make sure that you have a universal gas lighter refill fluid, uh, a little bit like this one. There are a few different brands, and this is what we're going to use to top up the torch when it runs out. Then you'll also need a solder probe. So this is just a fine kind of needle stick that we use if we want to move anything in our piece while we're soldering it or while it's hot. Obviously we don't want to use our fingers, so this is a really useful tool for that as well. Then you'll need some solder. So solder comes in three different grades, hard, medium and easy. I normally just keep the hard grade on my bench because that's the one that I use 90% of the time. The medium and easy I have stacked away, not far away, so that if I need to get to them I can. But I just normally have a little dish with my solder in there. Then sometimes I have this, again, not an essential piece of kit, but this is kind of like a wire mesh. And it's really useful if I want to get heat under the piece that I'm soldering. So I would just place that onto my solder brick while I'm soldering. And what it means is, especially if I've got a piece that I want to heat more from the bottom, then it just allows me to get the flame in there a little bit. So that's a nice little thing again to work up towards if you're thinking of doing this from home. Just makes your life a lot easier when you're trying to get a lot of heat around a piece. Then we need some tweezers. So I have steel tweezers, which I use most of the time, which are these ones. And I use these for picking up hot pieces. I also use them if I'm working with gemstones and I want to place a tiny gemstone onto a piece they're just very handy they're kind of like extensions of your hands really while you're working and brass tweezers are useful for when you're working with pickle which i'll show you in a moment pickle is a mild acid solution which can sound really scary but there are versions that are safe to use at home called safety pickle but we never want to put steel inside our pickle so that's why we use brass or plastic tweezers or even a plastic spoon to be able to do that section, so they're quite handy as well. Finally, on the soldering end, I like to have some binding wire. Again, not an essential, but as you build up your silversmithing and your silver jewelry making, this is gonna be a useful piece of kit as well. Binding wire is just a form of wire that you can attach around pieces when you're trying to hold them together. I find half the battle with soldering is just holding the piece in the right place. And binding wire really helps to do that and it won't solder to your piece or anything like that. So it's a useful bit to have on your bench. All right, so over here we've got some dividers. Dividers, again, are not essential, but they are useful. They help score out markings on our pieces and they're used particularly in wax carving if you're going to be working on that. And they I just use kind of the side to open and close them. You can see I've still got my little safety bits on. I'd take those off before I use them. It's a little bit like a compass. If you remember at school using a compass, it's basically a way that you can score circles or you can score straight lines on your piece so that you can know where you need to cut it or do various different things. I always have a heat proof dish with some water on my bench. Useful for safety, but also for quenching pieces, which is after I've heated them, I wanna make sure they cool down quickly, then I'll put them in the cold water. So make sure you've got a heat proof dish and just some regular water. A few other safety bits, it's useful to have some goggles. 
I wear these a lot when I'm working on a pendant motor, which is essentially a rotary tool that turns around and often a lot of dust comes off of it. If you're just starting out, you probably won't be working with anything like that straight away, but you might wanna use them when you're doing torch firing or anything that can bring up a lot of dust you might want to make sure you wear your, your goggles. To be honest, I don't wear them a lot, but they are handy to have. And when I need them, I make sure that I've got them on. You also might want to invest in some dust masks. So if you're going to be doing a lot of work with dust and in silversmithing and jewelry making, silver jewelry making, invariably there'll be a time when you want to wear a dust mask. So it's useful just to have some. I think you can buy a pack of 10 for not very much and just have them around the workshop for when you need them. Okay, we're getting there. Over here, I've also got some pliers, which I'm just going to bring over to show you. So you want to make sure you have a full set of pliers. So if you already do beading, then you'll probably have tons of these already. But if not, they are also very useful for silversmithing and silver jewelry making. So I've got, a f I'll have a full set on my bench. So I have round nose pliers, I'll have some D-shaped pliers, I'll have my flat nose pliers, my snipe nose pliers, and some cutters. The ones I use the most are my D-shaped pliers. They're very helpful for making rings and they're also very helpful for doing bezel settings. Now, when it comes to sanding, we've already talked about files. I also find it very helpful to have emery sticks, which are these, these bad boys here. Um, so I'm gonna use, how, how I do them is when I first buy them, they come and they've got the sandpaper already on them. But you can also attach your own. So you can see here, I've just got a piece of sandpaper, or sometimes it's called emery paper or wet and dry, and I'm just gonna place it around the stick. Then I get some masking tape. And that is a really useful bit of kit to be able to use for polishing up my pieces. So I'll have those in various different grades. Normally I try to have grade 400, 600, 800, 1000 and 1200 on my bench. Great, so that is a rundown of what I've got on my bench currently. I'm gonna clear them away and show you some other pieces as well. But just before I do, I just wanna let you know that not all of this is essential. So if you're feeling like there's no way you could start with all of this, the key bits that I would say you need are your jeweler's saw, a bench peg, a file, a soldering station, and that's probably enough to get going and perhaps a drill for drilling some holes in. Then everything else you can just gradually build up as you go along. A few other bits that I wanna show you on the bench now. You will need some pickle for your jewelry making. So pickle is a mild acid solution and I recommend using safety pickle which comes in a pot like this and it's called safety pickle salts. And you mix this with water heated water ideally, but not boiling. So you want it warm, but not boiling water. And what you do is you put your jewelry into the pickle after you've soldered or heated it, and it gets rid of the kind of the black stuff that's on it. I won't go into the, the science behind it at the moment, we'll keep it simple, but you wanna make sure that you have some pickle. And I used my pickle solution in a rice cooker, or I think they're called a crock pot if you're in the US. So this I just bought from the supermarket, it was about 15 pounds. Obviously use a different one that you use for food, so buy one specifically for your jewellery. I've got some hot water in there, and I've got my pickle salts, and I've just mixed them together. And I just leave that on while I'm making. There's a little kind of, uh, I can put it on low heat. I can also put it on high, I don't tend to put it on high, and I can also put it on warm. So I tend to leave it on a low heat, throughout my making and just dip my pieces in there, leave them in there for a while to pickle them when I need to. If you're literally just starting with jewelry making, you're not ready to do all of that just yet, another option is you can just use a jam jar or a heat proof jar and put your pickle salts in there, heat some heated water and use that for your pickle. And I've actually used that quite a lot of times and that works just as well as well. It's just the great thing about having a slow cooker is it will keep it warm throughout your making session. So if you wanna keep adding pieces to it, then you can do. So that's your pickle. Make sure you don't put your hands in the pickle, make sure you use tweezers and you wanna make sure that you use brass tweezers not steel ones, because you don't want to contaminate the piece. Another thing I wanted to show you, we talked about the steel block already. If you live in a flat or a house and you're worried about noise, because obviously when we're banging 
our hammer on a steel block that does make quite a lot of noise a sandbag is a really nice way to absorb that so you can buy one of these to put underneath your steel block and then when you're doing your hammering and you're doing your shaping it makes the noise so much less which is brilliant if you're living somewhere where you're a little bit worried about the noise implications another nice piece of kit absolutely not necessary to begin with is my doming blocks so this is a really nice doming block set and these are used for creating curves in your pieces so if i want to make round earrings for example and i want to curve them so they're concave i would use my block and my punches make sure you use the right size for the right hole and i would hammer in there so these come in all different kinds of sets so i've got quite a big set here you can start with a much smaller set and you can see i've got some really big pieces there if i wanted to dome a nice lentil bead or something like that i can make with those so a nice bit of kit to work up to a nice uh, birthday present or christmas present <laughs> from someone then we talked a little bit about drilling we talked about the pin vise. This is another nice drill that you can use. It's a little bit more powerful because I twist it round. When I've got a drill bit in the end, it's going to just add a little bit more power to the pieces that I'm making. So that's another option if you're not quite ready for an electric drill yet. In terms of polishing, I always like to have glanol, which is my favourite metal polish, and a polishing cloth on my bench. So this is for the final stages of polishing once I've gone through all my sandpapers and I've done all of that, which we'll cover as well in some of the courses, then this gives a really nice shine at the end. And I'm a big fan of polishing papers, which I use metal clay as well as silver jewelry, traditional silver jewelry. And this, this technique is probably taken more from metal clay using the different grades of polishing papers. So they're all different colors which represent how coarse they are. So you start with the green and then you go down. So I always have these on my bench as well. Again, not an essential, but just something I really like to give a nice mirror finish on your pieces. You may also want a ring sizer. If you're gonna be making lots of rings, especially for other people and you wanna size out their rings, this is a plastic one, which again was traditionally used for metal clay. You can also get metal ones, but a ring sizer is very useful if you're gonna be making rings. And finally, I just wanted to show you my rotary tumbler. Sometimes it's called a barrel tumbler or a barrel polish. This is the barrel. So it opens up and inside it's got water and steel shot. I'll just show you real quick. This is a really handy tool because it polishes your pieces. Now it's not quite as good as hand polishing, but it is a really nice way to get a general shine on a lot of your work. So inside I've got what's called steel shots, which are little bits of steel. So you buy those, you put them inside. I've got some water and I, you can either use a barrel tumbling compound or I actually also use fairy liquid in there and what I do is I pop my pieces in there once I've done the initial stages of polishing I'll pop my pieces in there then I'll put it onto the machine and it will turn it round and I'll leave them in there for maybe 20 minutes maybe half an hour sometimes a little bit more and they'll come out really nice shiny and clean so it just goes on top of this piece like that it's not plugged in at the moment when it plugs in it spins round. So if you've ever used like a gemstone tumbling tool or anything like that, it's a really similar kind of process. It does cost a little bit of money, but it's a really nice investment if you're making lots of silver jewelry and you want to be able to get a general shine over your pieces. So that is pretty much it. There are always more tools that you can buy and more things that you can look at and lots of goodies for jewelers. But I think that's sometimes the most exciting thing about doing this kind of jewelry making is that you start getting excited about different tools that you can save up to and add into your practice to make your pieces even more exciting. As I said, to get started with, you only need a basic kit. So start with the essentials, build up as you go. Don't be afraid to give it a try. And I look forward to seeing you on the next video when we're gonna be actually making some beautiful silver jewelry.